Coming up on Theater Talk. There's a reason why small towns are small, because nobody wants to live there, you know? <laughs> so, Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. New York City. This is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Now, Michael, I had never heard of Green Day before this season, and suddenly they are the absolute toast of Broadway. Yes, with a terrific new musical called American Idiot. You want to be an American idiot. Directed by the brilliant Michael Mayer, who won a Tony Award for Spring Awakening, of course, and who's been a frequent guest on Theater Talk. So welcome back, Michael. And you brought with you someone who's um, new to me. But is a major rock star. And much of the Broadway world. <laughs> One Billy Joe Armstrong, I believe. With an IE. Yep, that's me. <laughs> uh, a new composer and lyricist on Broadway. <laughs> welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, now, this is your, your Broadway debut, correct, Billy Joe? Oh, yeah. And yeah. did you ever have, I, I mean, I know you've got this little career as a, as a rock star. <laughs> for, um, for, side project, but, side project. Side, yeah. but, it, but has Broadway been something that you always wanted to do? I'm not sure. I mean, um, I, I think we started, uh, you know, doing the, the record for American Idiot, and I think it was the first time, you know, we'd already been a band for about, uh, you know, 12 years or something, so we were kind of thinking in terms like we wanted to expand the idea of making an album because we didn't feel like anybody was doing it. So we had, as you know, we had this. Um, we want, you know, we had this song called Homecoming, mm -hmm. and we had uh, the song American Idiot, and the song Homecoming was sort of about uh, a day in the life of me, Mike, and Trey, my other band members, and it was basically we were just taking thirty-second clips and just adding them together, and we made this sort of beast of a song. It was like a nine-minute uh, epic, and then uh, we had the song American Idiot, which was, you know. Just feeling, you know, alienated and, and you know, uh, feeling misrepresented in the, the Bush era. Don't wanna be an American idiot. Don't want a nation under the new media. And um, and then we just thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to just to, to make a concept record or a rock opera, and you know. Um, and you know, and but also make it very political at the same time. When you first heard American Idiot, the album, did you have any sense that this could be a musical? Not immediately. Mm. I did. You he listened to it just because you like the music. I was a big fan of Green Day, and I was listening to American Idiot a lot when I was making the movie Flicka. Yeah. And I was driving up and down the PCH, mm -hmm. and that was the CD that was in my rental car. So I listened to it day after day after day. I couldn't get enough of it. Mm. And it occurred to me that I was having the same kind of relationship with that album that I had with any number of musical albums that I would listen to over and over and over again. So a little, something, a little thing went off in, deep down in my reptile brain <laughs> that, that said, this could be this could be uh, a rock opera that that's really that could be staged. Did you like uh, the, the the sort of classic rock operas like Tommy, Jesus Christ, Superstar? That uh, I think many began as concept albums. Did you like these things? Yeah, I. You know what? It's funny. I got a um, Jesus Christ Superstar tattoo when I was. That's right here. That's the logo for the show. And I, I had it. I got it when I was about 19 <laughs> years old. Um, and I never heard the record. I never, <laughs> and but I just thought, wow, that's, that's a beautiful image. You know, it was in my my fr friend's record collection, and then, um, and then, but I, you know, I, I just started when we wanted to start getting into like having more of a, kind of a, big monster theatrical piece that, or like rock theater. We had to start thinking outside of the box. Mm -hmm. You know, so we started, we started listening to different things like you know. You know, uh, a, a quick one by The Who, Tommy by The Who, Z you know, Ziggy Stardust, Spiders from Mars. You know, we listen to songs from like West Side Story, <laughs> some, uh, things from Hair, and just to try to figure out. We were learning how the dynamic of of, of like like 
changing scenes, like in a song like Jesus of Suburbia, mm -hmm. um, to go from some kind, something that is so completely intensely angry, and then all of a sudden something is, you know, just drops down and is sort of, you know, beautiful, like, you know, you're trying to be more pretty or something. Something like gentle that. and tender to get the proper pacing of, mm -hmm. of a musical. But exactly. you heard that in the album when you listened to it? Absolutely. The more I listened to the whole record, I started to really uh, parse out a narrative mm -hmm. that was very compelling to me about this kid, um, the Jesus of suburbia, you know, waking up one day and realizing that this world he has inherited isn't really where he wants to be. And so he makes this journey mm. to the city and he meets St. Jimmy and this girl and there's this triangle and, and an eventual homecoming. So at the beginning of, of this show, he, they say, I don't want to be an American idiot. I mean, it sounds trivial. This is a very well-known album, but I'm coming new to it. What does that mean? What do they not want to be? What are they running from? Um, you know, at the time it was, um, you know, there's there's so much information overload, whether it's, you know, the things that you get from the Internet. I think there was also uh, the war in Iraq where we were seeing reality television uh, meeting, uh, you know, journalism and war at the same time and seeing these journalists embedded in the tanks and going in. And, and I was just thinking, man, this is not a video game, you know, <laughs> which I'm not, you know, that, that's what mm, you see in mm, a video game. Mm. And that's what was, and I was just trying to find out, like, well, what is it? What, what does this mean to me? Because I, I can't. I think a, a, one theme that's in my songs a lot. It's not necessarily anger, but it's the sense of feeling lost. Mm. And so with American Idiot, that's you know, that's when we were. I, I, it was so there was something self-deprecating about it. And you're like, I don't want to be this, even though I, I, I feel represented or misrepresented. You know. So and then we were tr after that we were just thinking like, well, who is this person and how does he break out? And the next thing after that naturally was. Jesus of Suburbia, and then that was like, that was going down um, a very uh, dark, you know, you know, time in my past and, you know, and, but, but uh, you know, giving it a character and a name to it. It, it is very dark. Uh, one's going to, of course, see analogies to hair mm -hmm. as a, you know, a, a, an influence that you've evolved from that. But in that world of drugs and, and, and free love, it, 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 there's a, and more, there's a light sort of at the end of the tunnel, whereas in American Idiot, it's these people start out, they're not happy, they're unhappy from the mm -hmm. get-go. Mm -hmm. But trying to find happiness. Trying mm -hmm. to find happiness. You know. Why is it different? Is the culture ch change? Well, you know, the big difference, I, I would say, between like maybe like uh, the 60s era and, you know, and maybe now that, that we're in, you know, the 21st century, it's... Um, you know, people didn't know better when it, the drugs and, and 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 the sexual revolution and that was all a brand new thing and nobody knew what the repercussions were. Right now, an era that we live in, I feel like it's like it's old enough to know better, but too young to care. You know, mm -hmm. and that's um, kind of what comes across. You know, I, I think you know Johnny, you know who, who, the the character that John Gallagher plays, he really kind of goes into this world where he's trying to find truth trying to find something, a deeper meaning in life, just wh whatever, you know, just give me something to believe in. He's basically saying, I got to get out of this very stilted, boring life that yeah. I can case myself in. Yeah, right. and it's like a, you know, it's like a, it's its own personal sociological experiment because to break out of, the reason, there's a reason why small towns are small, because nobody wants to live there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you want something, you want to find more people, more you know, more interesting people and find something and go out and at least strike out on your own. Yeah. And that's what he's doing and he's trying to self-educate himself. And then, but at the same time, which a lot of people can relate to, is that you get into something where you go from self-righteous to self-destructive. Uh, yes, and he falls victim mm -hmm. to drugs. To the, to the temptations yeah. of the city. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, this comparison to hair, and I'm wondering, Michael, with your great background in the, the classic musicals, mm -hmm. I get a sense, well, American Idiot and Spring Awakening are both shows that are really pushing the musical theater forward. In a way, it hasn't been pushed forward really since, you know, maybe with Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice when they were writing true rock musicals. Mm -hmm. And yet still, though, I'm always aware that you know a musical can't be totally about alienation and um, nihilism, mm -hmm. that there has to be some lighter quality to it because that's what 
people on Broadway respond to you. Do you draw on the traditions of the old musicals working in this new framework that you're in? Absolutely. I was just saying the other day that um, structurally, even though this is a, like a punk rock opera, mm -hmm. structurally, there, this is not that different from, say, Fiddler on the Roof. You have tradition, which is the, you meet the community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? We have American Idiot. You meet the whole community. It's like a prologue. You're setting up your world. Yes. The next thing that happens in Fiddler is Tevye talks to the audience. He says a couple things, and then he has his song, If I Were a Rich Man, which basically describes exactly where he is and what his hopes and dreams are. The classic I want song. Yep, and yeah. so then that's what Jesus of Suburbia is. Basically, Johnny looks at us, he says a few things, he and his two friends introduce themselves a little bit, and then all of Jesus of Suburbia is basically them saying, this is who we are, mm -hmm. and we want something more. Mm -hmm. We want to find what you believe, you know? I leave behind this hurricane of lies. I don't know if I'm allowed to say or not, but. And we'll give you the Elaine Stritch dispensation. Oh, she's <laughs> that term on the, PBS. Or or the <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? So it's, it's actually, uh, there's a classic structure mm -hmm. to so this. Were you conscious of that while you, while you did it? Because you guys are the co collaborators on the book. Yeah. Right. I became more and more conscious of it as I started delving into it. Mm -hmm. And once, once Billy and I talked and he gave me the go ahead to start developing my concept for it and I went further and further into it I realized how sturdy this gorgeous material was and how much story it could hold and how much how many how many different stories it could hold as well do you uh, as the creator of, of this these songs do you give Michael did you give him free reign to do whatever he wanted to with them, I mean, how how much over his shoulder were you looking at? Were you ever worried that I don't he might like, be too Broadwayized your sound? No, I you know what you know. It was all just a learning process for me. So you know, he took me to see Spring Awakening, and I, I loved it. Um, and um, and I remember you know the first conversation uh, I, I had, I was like, yeah, let's do this. You know, I, you know, I, it, I, I you know, and I think when someone is that creative and that um, passionate, and um, I, you you have to kind of be hands off in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and let them let him do his thing, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what you know. I put full faith into what you know his vision and what he wanted to do. And the first conversation we ever had was really funny because I go, "Do you have an idea?" <laughs> and he goes, "Yes, but I'm not going to tell you." <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? That's an old Broadway director's <laughs> ploy. He's been using that on everybody. <laughs> now, now why, why wouldn't you tell him? Well, it was I honestly, it was so. Um, embryonic you know that I didn't want to I didn't want to say something to him that was so unformed that it would sound puerile you know when this the, I, I really think that American Idiot the album is a masterpiece mm -hmm. and I'm was so passionate about it and I what I really wanted was for him to give me the opportunity to go ahead and start fleshing it out mm -hmm. and come up with basically a scenario. So I really thought if I told you just the little shred of an idea that I had at the time that you'd say, eh, that's not so interesting. And what was that shred of the idea? The shred of an idea was that it would be three friends who all sort of at the same time recognized the pointlessness of their existence at that moment and recognized that they had a bad faith relationship to their country mm. and that they wanted to change that mm. and that they would go into the world and somehow they would be separated and come back together mm -hmm. that's Doesn't sound what like I a bad knew. idea I would have said yes to that if you told me right off the bat um, yeah I, I didn't really know it was mostly like emails and phone calls and, and it was just sort of slowly coming coming out and and uh, you know, and I, I just thought every, it was all a good representation of a lot of people's experiences, you know, especially within the past 
you know, eight years, you know, post 9-11 mm -hmm. era, mm -hmm. you know, so I thought it was, a good, it was a great idea. Now you have one of the characters join up to the military, mm -hmm. and Michael jokingly said to me, well, except for losing a leg, he kind of came out the best. Yeah, I actually yeah. thought in a way, because a lot of the, the sentiment uh, of the songs, of course, anti-war, but looking at the, how the three characters end up, the guy loses a leg, but he's found a woman mm -hmm. whom he loves and loves him. Mm -hmm. The one guy has not left the couch. Right. The other guy has gone into the drug hell and mm -hmm. come out, but it's ambivalent if he's ever going to make anything of himself. Right. And at the end, the one guy you think who actually has gotten his life together is the guy who joined the military. Yeah, that's ironic. It's that ironic. Way. Did yeah. you? Is that a, a, intentional on your it part? It wasn't until I realized that his extraordinary girl would come home with him, mm. and that was um, well into the process, uh, like about a year ago. When, when that occurred to me. I, did, I, did, I actually find the ending kind of hopeful. Honestly, I feel like that all three of them, I think Will actually does get off the couch. You see that he makes this uneasy truce with Heather and her new boyfriend. Oh, I love the, that. And he's, got, and he's holding, holding his baby. Yeah. He's owning the fact that he's got this son. And I think that Johnny, even though he has screwed up his life, completely. He did, you know, there were two choices he could make. He could have continued down the path of self-destruction mm -hmm. and he actually, he actually killed off that, that bad part of himself. And, and, and he gets off the heroin, which yeah. as you just said, which is no small yeah, matter. It's a big uh, deal. Is that, is that, is that theme, the, the, the ultimate, the, the ultimate optimism of the show, is that inherent in your work, do you think? Uh, I like to try to find like a, uh, you know, a light at the end of a tunnel with, you know, when, when I'm making an album, you know, um, like the last, I mean, the, our last album, 21st Century Breakdown, is a song called See the Light at the very end. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I didn't really know. I think, like, the part of, um, I think, you know, I think reflection is a really good um, ritual to go through to, in order to, to, to figure out who you are. You got to think about your past. You can't just abandon it, you know, where a lot of people say, live in the moment, live in the moment, just go, f just go forward. Well, you need to have some, you know, you need to take some lumps and bruises along the way, you know. So, you know, I mean, after Homecoming, which is like this sort of, you know, uh, bittersweet, glorious kind of ending to these guys' journey, then all of a sudden there's that reflective part where, with the song What's Her Name, where he's, you know, Gallagher, he sings the line, oh. um, I can remember the face, but I can't recall the name. And you're just like, and then that moment right there, like just, kills me every single time because the way he delivers it you're just like you know he's like a he's like he's like you're you're a fool but you're also you've also gained something you're smart because of the process mm -hmm. right yeah no it's, a, it's an effective ending there because it doesn't it's not just happy ending right not, at, not at all at the very when he does say that you're still a fool mm -hmm. and that's why i think you don't know if this guy's ever really going to get it but the look only... if someone can say at the end of it if they could say, don't want to be an American idiot at the beginning, and at the very end say, she was right, I am an yes. idiot, yes. <laughs> then that is awareness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think self-awareness can only lead to something positive. Right, and then that's the only redemption. Now, are you getting um, no. young people coming to American Idiot thinking that uh, Billy Joe Armstrong is in it? You know, we haven't. You haven't. I think maybe a little in Berkeley early on. You don't get a sense of kids little... thinking that this is a, 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 a concert? They're... No, we haven't had that, which is um, fortunate since they would be really disappointed. <laughs> 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 I, I, I want to move back a little, a little bit to how you structured. You made the decision between you not to, n not to have lines, only to, only to use the lyrics sung through. of the song, yeah. had to be sung through, which I think ultimately turned out to be a very brilliant decision. Oh, but good. how did that work? It was it was very tricky. I, I set myself up uh, for a very difficult assignment. I knew that I wasn't going to interrupt the order of the record. That mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. absolutely a given for myself. Mm -hmm. And when Billy made certain other material available to me, as the characters started to take on their own dimensions and, and requirements, I, I found a couple B-sides from the American Idiot European release, which is Favorite Son and Too Much Too Soon. And then on one of the uh, special packaging of the of the CD here, there were these um, really amazing journal entries that Billy wrote uh, to accompany uh, the CD. And I saw those, and I was like, Oh my God, this stuff is great! I can use this interstitially in, in just little shards to just help 
place us where we are um, and to just help um, organize um, the journey of these characters from song to song. Mm -hmm. And then when they were recording their spectacular record, 21st Century Breakdown, um, he started sending me um, MP3s of the songs as, the, as they were doing um, the demos, and they were just blowing my mind. And I kept thinking, God, this would be great for Tunney. This would be a great thing for Heather. And so it started taking on. And so you a let him more. use the new songs in in the in the musical that you were writing for the other album. Um, yeah, I just I had a bunch of demos, and then I you know he because he was just looking to try to, to fill certain gaps and to, to tell the story. So I sent him I think I sent you like ten songs yeah. or something like that, and um, you know he was you know he was just he's like did a little song shopping. Yeah, you know, I was, like, I was I'll, greedy. I'll, I'll take that. I'll exactly. take that. Pillaging take the that. catalog. Pillaging the catalog. Yeah. Now, having gone through this experience of, of working on a musical, do you have any a musical based on songs that you had written for the concept album? Do you have any desire to write a musical, an original musical from scratch, where all the songs are written specifically for a Broadway show? Um, sure, that'd be great. You know, I mean, you need a good story first. You know, um, I mean, I'd love to work with if he ever had an idea. I'd love to work with Michael again with something, and you know, um, but yeah, awesome. it's definitely there's um, there's a certain you know, I, like I said, I'm new to all of this. I'm like this, so this energy that people have, and the you know, and even the the, the other uh, plays that are, are being put on right now. It's like it's just it's very infectious to me to be yeah. around all yeah. these creative people, you know, constantly and. Um, you know, it's like a drug. You, it's like you, I, you can't get enough of yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to so. ask you, what's the most enjoyable thing you've discovered about Broadway as a, as a, as a newcomer? Um, I just think just the people that are, all the people that are involved, you know, uh, as, you know, you know, it's Michael or Tom Kitt or, you know, um, Gallagher, and Rebecca, Theo, you know what I mean? All the people that are in the, the cast and how, um, uh, why don't we just, be, you know, we've kind of, we had we kind of opened our door to, to to them and and they've opened their doors to us so it's been it, we've just been having a great time together. anything about broadway think... you're all ambivalent to though any uh, have you shown him sort of the darker side of this business at all I've michael no i've kept that hidden <laughs> cuz i really want him to write that other show <laughs> <laughs> he's a very shrewd guy what kind of kid were you before you start before you became a rock star uh, you, uh, you know the when before you started as you became a poet, mm -hmm. essentially, what kind of kid were you? Were you? Um, you know, pretty daydreamy. Um, uh, you know, kind of, a, a little lost, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've I've been involved in music since I was four and a half. Yeah. So I mean, I uh, that's kind of how I got into music to begin with because I, I started. I was doing this. I had this vocal teacher, and she taught me all these sort of classic Broadway and standards and things like that. Uh, and then, which I never really said anything to anybody about, you know. Um, and then I started getting into punk rock, uh, punk rock scene in Berkeley um, around uh, when I was 14. And so I just, you know, and I, me, I've known Mike, our bass player, since I was 10. Wow. And we, we, we've been in bands, in a band together pretty much since we met. So um, the kind of kid I was, I don't know, I mean, kind of thrill seeker a little bit, you know, but. Um, Were you angry? Um. Dr. Freud over here. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just think um, kind of lost, you lost. know, but uh, and, and angry too, you know. You know, I just think with in in terms of, you know, just like coming from a bit of a broken home, and uh, you know, and uh, um, and I think that's the one thing that that punk, you know, being in the punk scene really um, it allowed me to have is like something where I could channel that energy mm -hmm. into something to try to you know make more sense of life. You know, using anger uh, and uh, and uh, that feeling of being lost and and, and channel it into song. This description yeah. of a childhood sounds like if you like her Gypsy when you were a kid, you could have become a show queen rather than a punk rocker. He could have <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very yeah. close. These two sorts of things. He does a mean um, version of uh, together wherever we go. <laughs> Just so you know. Do you really? <laughs> What's your favorite of the of the of the classic Broadway songs? The old, the standard catalog that we all know by heart. Oh God! Um, I don't know if I necessarily have a favorite. I, you know, there's, there's certain things like ever, ever since talking to Michael, there, it's there's been jogging my memory. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't thought about in the past, and I, you know, I did like the like a, a, you know the the uh, Al Jolson medley, you know, um, 
uh, you know, California, here I come, rockabye baby. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and I did, um, you know, songs from Oliver, you know, like Where's Love, and uh, I did Kids from um, uh, Bye Bye Birdie and um, uh, Gypsy. Um, I'm telling you, scratch a rock star, find, find a show queen. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's really true. I, was, I could see a Green Day cover album of uh, the great hits of Broadway's Golden Age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could be doing it. Be fascinated. So, well, listen, American Idiot is a, a new addition to the classic American musical theater. It is at the St. James Theater now, directed brilliantly by Michael Mayer and written by a newcomer to the scene, Billy Joe Armstrong. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater oh, Talk. Thank you very much. Good luck with the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>